my talk is about uh, dark patterns. Um, uh, yeah, so let's just get straight into it because there's a few things got to go over. So yeah, I'm Karis Connell. I'm the director of experience design. So I am a designer. This will be important later on um, uh, at a company called Global Mechanic here in town. Uh, I'm really interested in emerging technologies. Uh, so uh, um, we look at future technologies, where things are heading, uh, and the implications of that on people and how people behave. So, uh, right. So, um, yeah, I mean, the first thing, so what are dark patterns? Does ever, anyone know what, has anyone heard of this before? Dark patterns. It is a thing. Right. So at least two people. Good. <laughs> so, uh, dark patterns are uh, something that's recognized in uh, the design world. Um, it is, uh, I think it's been around as a recognized thing since 2011. A guy called Harry Brignall in the UK first sort of brought this up. He's a designer, he was a user experience designer. And he was looking at the design of websites and he was kind of like having these moments. So I was like, this is like, this can't be designed in this way on purpose, surely. Like this experience is really bad. Is this just bad design or is it bad design? By design. So uh, yeah, this is kind of like what this means. And so we're going to look at like now, and we're going to extrapolate this into like future technologies. So yeah, this is what it is. Dark patterns, they are behaviors that are specifically designed to encourage users to make mistakes. And you would think, well, that makes no sense. Now, why would anyone go and do that? Because, you know, that would give an awful experience, you know, for a company or like going to a portal. Well, there is a reason why. Um, it's for the financial benefit of an individual company or government entity. So it can be used for all these different means. Um, probably uh, people in the ad industry are more closely linked to this historically um, because, you know, often these things these uh, campaigns and systems that are put in place are there to, to generate uh, profit for companies. Uh, but it's also something that's in services and products out there on the market. So uh, I'll just give a couple of uh, 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 examples in a minute. This is the kind of user flow. So for the non-designers, designers, designers uh, in the room probably use the idea of like the, the kind of the idea of an IA map or a user flow. And this is, the, uh, this is the dark pattern user flow. So you come in and, I mean, this could be anything. It doesn't, this is not explicit. This is just used for example. You come into some kind of home page. This could be a website. This could be uh, uh, a product even. Um, and you've got sign up, subscribe. And you know how you've always got these kind of odd placed buttons and you're like, why is that there? What happens if I click it? I, I often get this, I'm like looking at a button, I'm like, Hmm, there's a checkbox here. What does it mean exactly? There's a bit of copyright lingo going on. And you have to kind of negotiate these waters. And uh, uh, yeah, you kind of hope, it's a bit like Russian roulette, you come out the other side without making too many mistakes uh, signing up for things. So uh, one example here, this is a, a screenshot from uh, uh, Shaw's website. I've, I've got a Shaw account. And uh, uh, I signed up to a bunch of channels some months ago now, packaged channels, it was a real Big mistake. Um, I went in digitally through their portal, and it's like sign up, get in there, you know, manage manage services, right? Manage all your services. Brilliant. Don't need to talk to anyone and go in. I can add channels. There's buttons in there. Add channels. I did it. After a while, I was like, I don't want these channels, so I'm just going to go in and deselect them. But you can't. There is no deselect. Uh, there's no way to switch anything off. So I was like, what the hell? I was like looking around the site and uh, yeah, you have to call them, get in the queue, make sure you click the right number, get talking to the right person and they'll try and talk you out of it. So you have these kind of patterns of behavior which are not really in your interest. Um, another one, I mean, this is, you know, this is not just to single out Shore, if anyone's from Shore here. This is common with like uh, flight websites, you know, when they try and get you to sign up to like flight insurance by cunningly putting it somewhere in the flow before you check out. Like maybe you should click on this or you know, maybe it's kind of put in a way that seems like you're saying no and actually you're saying yes. Um, this is about manipulation. So uh, 
The other one is uh, Apple. So, uh, and again, this isn't to single out just Apple, but this was an example that was pulled up. When iOS 6 was released, and this has been the same ever since, uh, they had uh, ad tracking in there for advertisers. And uh, so, they, but they wanted to have a button that would make sure that people could opt out. So they buried it. <laughs> uh, so it's in settings and it's in the about screen of settings. Now, why would advertising be in the about when that's normally about your phone itself? And then you go down through the whole list of this stuff and you get to the bottom where it's advertising. And you click that and you get to that screen. I don't know what that means. Limit ad tracking off on. Like, what does that mean? And it's specifically designed in that way, so you're not quite sure whether you are specifically switching on the off tracking or it's off, so am I being tracked? You know, and that is a, a, what's called a, a dark pattern. So um, who, who, the, who the hell is responsible for this kind of stuff? You know, I mean, it, it's awful, right? Well, it's evil <laughs> fucking designers. That's what it is. And uh, it really is. And this is something, you know, to, uh, to, to, to give them the benefit of the tiniest bit of doubt is that a lot of designers are in uh, jobs and situations where they have pressure from clients to do evil fucking things, right? So they design bad, I mean, it kind of goes against the Hippocratic oath of being a, a, a user experience designer. Um, you're not getting into learning this trade in order to make bad things and make sure that people have these kind of, uh, uh, or you set these traps. But when the big company is looking down and looking at the bottom line and saying, we've got to make money here, and if you don't make money, then you don't have a job, then these designers do these very shit things. So. Um, yeah, it's their, it's, it's really their, their fault. But they're still utter bastards, though, so just to, and I'm a designer, so I don't do that. So. Um, but it's okay, because, I mean, profit is sweet, even if it comes from deception. That's what uh, Sophocles said, so, I mean, it can't be too bad. I just wanted to, you know, sweeten it up for the designers out there that do these bad things. It's like, you know, it's not so bad. Um, but now... We're, uh, we're going to enter the age of emotive coercion. So this is an image from 1968. It is the first virtual reality system out there. So it was done by NASA. And uh, that guy's spinning around endlessly. He doesn't spin around endlessly. It is a GIF, so he didn't just keep... That's you know, the whole thing. Um, what, it's, and what I've done is try to, to, try to symbolize this, you know, I think everyone here knows what VR is. Probably heard a lot of hype about Oculus and uh, Facebook and uh, Samsung and all these other manufacturers that are rushing in to, to do stuff. But it's kind of interesting for me to look at these dark patterns that are based on websites and are based on products on screens into looking into how it's going to be in the future when the screen isn't a screen, <coughs> you're in the screen. You're in the thing itself and how, what the implications of that are. So it's going to make the old way of like accidentally <coughs> clicking buttons look like child's play in the future. So this is the coming of AR and, and VR. So yeah, this, is, <laughs> um, uh, this, isn't <coughs> this isn't really an Apple keynote. This is a mashup of They Live and uh, Apple keynote. Does anyone know what They Live is, the John Carpenter film? Amazing film. Uh, I just wanted to put that in there somewhere because... Uh, it, it, it fits this idea. Um, yeah, one day we'll, we will be wearing these kinds of devices. Um, it might not be today. It might not be tomorrow. I wear them already. I haven't got them on now, but uh, I wear them in my day-to-day -day life because I research it and, and design within it. But I know that uh, in the next couple of years, it will be a different world out there in terms of the exposure to these systems in your day-to-day -day lives. So uh, I did this because I thought, you know, if Apple launched this, then, of course, you know, if Apple had a VR system, everyone would be like, well, yeah, you've got to need this. But it's, what's interesting about it is it's the future of where the Internet will live. The Internet will migrate from the rectangles to being where you live. So it's no longer you're looking at it, you're in it again. So this affects the idea of coercion and how to coerce people into doing things. So, um, 
Yeah, VR is uh, uh, pretty amazing now. Um, you know, the levels of fidelity that you can get from it, um, the level of graphic quality is at a point of, of uh, well, you have to see it. I was going to put some screenshots up, but it's kind of pointless because you have to be in it to see it. But it's really, really getting there, and within the next year, it will really be there. Mm. One thing that's interesting about this is the amount of research going into VR systems from the military, the governments, and like the medical industry. So it's not just gamers. You know, it's not just for, 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 for first-person shooters. But they see it as actually a valuable tool. And the reason why they see it as a valuable tool is not because it's like, I just want an awesome heavy thing stuck to my face. Um, it's nothing like that. Or it's not like it's a cool thing and we think it's going to be cool for consumers. It's because they realize it's a direct connection to the, to the brain on a level that is not possible with other types of technology out there. And so you know, it's not the same as Google Glass. It's not the same as heads-up displays. Uh, so we'll clarify any confusion there. Um, what this allows you to do and, and what companies like Nike spend a lot of money on with their athletes is they put them into these VR spaces and they basically get them into what they call the zone and it's a, a state of flow. So when you get people into a state of flow, their body believes what they're seeing and they absorb information at a much greater rate than they do when they're not in this space. And so. Uh, for in the medical industry, they're looking at it for treating post-traumatic stress disorder because it's actually more successful than sitting in a room with treatment and, uh, sorry, with somebody who's going to treat you and, uh, and doing it that way. Instead, they will put them into the space and they finely tune the environment. So the user experience, so to speak, is complete. There's no outside interference. You control everything. Um, the other side of it with the military is they find it far more successful for military training. They compared it to sending troops out onto the battlefield in exercises and put them into VR states where they were wearing this and they were going through it in, in, a, in a virtual space. And it was photorealistic. It wasn't like some like NAF sort of graphics, <laughs> 3D graphics. It was photorealistic. And uh, they found again that the, the, uh, the soldiers were uh, learning things much, much quicker and obviously a lot cheaper and a lot faster. So um, in that way, it's really powerful. So the thing behind that is what's interesting. And what is interesting for me as a designer, again, the evil part. So it's, uh, um, what's, what's really interesting is that you get a visceral and guttural reaction with VR and deep AR or mixed mode reality, which you don't get with other types of technology. And what that means is really uh, dopamine. So uh, dopamine is a motivator. It's released when we have the expectation of reward. And once this neurotransmitter becomes hardwired into a psychological reward loop, the desire to get more of that reward becomes the brain's overarching preoccupation. In other words, we can now design experiences, user experiences, that you get addicted to, that you cannot stop using, which is a weird thing for UX designers because Designers are always trying to get to the point where they can make something amazing. So they can tell everyone, hey, it's really successful. It's super cool. Or people are using it. What about when people are addicted, like actually cannot stop when it's too good? So this is interesting. Um, uh, this guy here, Mihaly Sizentrum, a, a, a psychologist. Um, <laughs> Uh, he came up with this kind of like philosophical approach to the idea of flow, and he said that it should be about every action, movement, and thought follows inevitably from the previous one, like playing jazz. So this brings up, again, an interesting idea of like, the mental state of, of people in the future. Like right now, we have staring at phones, clicking on screens, maybe those, those dark patterns you deal with right now. You've got your wits about you. It's a screen. You're like, you're kind of pissed off. You're like, oh, I've got to get through this thing, this form, whatever it is. What happens when it's not form-based? What happens when you're actually booking a flight by, for example, going and being in a virtual environment where you would book the flight? And what about if somebody's coercing you into making decisions? It's a lot easier than putting a checkbox somewhere than someone coming up and literally manhandling you into making a certain decision in the virtual space or chasing you down a dark alley into a dead end 
where you only have one choice. So this is kind of uh, something that obviously the media is interested in, Forbes. Uh, legal heroin is virtual reality, our next hard drug. Well, obviously, because this soldier is completely off his face. So uh, I think, uh, yeah, they, they can see something in this. But I mean, we see a lot of interest around this. And, and the reason why is because of exactly that. There is this, this genuine fear on one side. There's a genuine excitement from brands and advertising on the other side, uh, because it's the uh, encapsulation of emotion and coercion that you cannot get in, in other ways. So, I mean, if dark patterns of the future will be, instead of clicking the wrong button, you're, you're literally strong-armed, guided to make the right decision. Uh, if you don't, you're kind of dropped out of the flow. They can just end the experience. And you don't want that, because you're addicted to it. So it's like a hit. Like, why would you want to? It's just much nicer to just go with the flow. So let's just go with it, right? Um, it's going to be no longer about UX designers as we know them right now. As I look at myself and my peers and my colleagues, people who design things in a traditional way, we're now evil fucking alchemists. We're no longer designers because now what we're talking about, we're designing emotional responses, blush responses. We're trying to work out how your pupils dilate. We can see that. We can see how you get addicted. We can see your heartbeat get faster. We can measure that. We're able to engineer it. So you won't leave. You will never want to leave. So uh, of course, you, you, people are like, yeah, screw this future. It's crap. I just switch the thing off. I mean, you can do that. But you can opt out, do all these things. But why would you? Because I mean, we've just seen in the previous slide, you go into the real world, you're going to be monitored. You're going to live in a fucked up city. You know, it's going to be like, it's going to suck. It's much nicer in here. Really, we can make it beautiful for you. You can be whatever you want to be. And we'll help you be the best you can be. I practice that. Um, so trust us. We're, we're looking after your best interests. We only want you to stay with us. And really, we want you to stay in the happy place. That's what it is. And that, actually, this is interesting. This, this picture is quite famous in, in, in VR space. It comes from a Vancouver uh, illustrator. So it's kind of like worldwide known as the, uh, the kind of utopian idea of the future, a dilapidated, abandoned cities with PowerPoints, people living out their lives uh, in a virtual space as long as you click on the right buttons. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs>